Thank you very much, um, I'm Tenet Smith Levet, and uh, by training, I'm an economist, I'm a historian, but um, slowly I developed my career into sociology and lately what I call European studies. And in the last decade, I became, thanks to this wonderful city that we are uh, at the moment, um, I became kind of uh, quote unquote cultural heritage manager because I fell in love with this city. I'm from Budapest, um, a very strong um, Budapest identity from one of the um, best part of the city close to Hero Square. I'm going to show you some images about it. The Theresian Stadt. Um, and I don't have any family roots here any relatives in Western Panoni. I don't give you the whole story, but um, <clears throat> I suppose that I should not give a type of keynote speech today, but we had heard yesterday was a proper, um, larger framework, um, theoretical, and very thought-provoking. But my talk would be rather a kind of post-keynote speech. I would start, I would like to start to interpret what we have around ourselves, what we used to have around ourselves in the early 20th century. <coughs> and I'm really sorry uh, that it's impossible to introduce each other to each other because we of that of time. Um, but I really hope that there will be more space for interpersonal dialogue. Um, I am obviously a true believer in, in this nice slogan that um, culture uh, is basically a fluid concept. It exists in co-creation. So with every step in our life, in this conference including, we are recreating our culture, our cultural identity. And, and understanding and reinterpreting heritage is a very important exercise, both for scholars, academics, um, cultural heritage and practitioners like cultural heritage management people, uh, museum directors and, and interpreters and so on and so forth. So very welcome. My first um, introductory <coughs> slides are about um, a project and a new way of thinking which um, um, embodied in a research project we call CRAFT. Kraft is um, an abbreviation and a little bit um, uh, playing with, with the letters. It should be Kraft because it comes from creative cities and sustainable region. But I, <coughs> as a sociologist working here in Somatai and Kusek, uh, discover me by talking to investors, uh, state and multinational companies um, who believe that small cities don't count. I started to think about the importance of small cities, their cultural heritage, and, <coughs> and I tried to put it in a historical context. So, um, <clears throat> my first point is that I think we are in a time of um, the renaissance of small cities and um, in the 21st century. Um, well, if you think about cities going back to the ancient times, there were always um, important factors which were actually um, somehow put together by, by history. Um, let's go to the next one. Um, we have in Central Europe here a lot of small and medium-sized cities and a lot of what I call potential city assemblies especially here in West Pannonia. For a multinational company, it is very easy to say that Kursa, with its 12,000 inhabitants, doesn't count. It's a village, I was told by some of them. It's a nice place, some nice building, but it's a village, friends. What do you want with that? From an investment point of view, he might be right, but I don't agree. So uh, the idea to connect um, cities with each other, like for example the Kursak Sombatai City Assembly, might help to overcome this shortcoming and to create a larger space. 
but only to create a larger space for investment is not enough. So my question was how to make how to make these small and medium-sized cities attractive places, first of all for the inhabitants who are living there, who are born there, because it's a, a, a very known tendency in Central Europe, Eastern Europe, that people, young generations, are leaving there. Basically, they go to the West in the hope of a better life, yeah? And others from the East are coming here to Hungary, so that it's a kind of internal migration process in Europe. Now, um, so looking back in history, uh, Italian cities, um, Emilia Romagna, for example. The very interesting, not so known example, the University of Bologna decided when it celebrated its imagined thousands anniversary um, not to build another huge campus in Bologna on the other part of the city and build a big baton construction, but go to the region. And they created the network. Rimini, Ravenna, Cesena, Forli became the campuses of the Bologna University, and the situation uh, can be parallel with what we have in, in Western Pannonia. So that's, that's the second point we have in, in, in academia, in, in teaching, in university, in higher education. We have, I think, an important responsibility to deal with the fact that our knowledge creation and the knowledge distribution is very much outdated. Um, and it's not, it doesn't have direct impact on our on neighborhood. We are in ivory towers, and of course there are wonderful universities everywhere in the world, exceptions, I believe, in the United States, I know that. But most of the higher educational units have lost their impact with their neighbor, neighborhoods, and um, actually they're isolated <coughs> small places or bigger places, which um, which do not correspond to the challenges of, the, of, of our times. So if you, if you look at the, the critical mass, um, what, what, what brings a city, what makes a city important? What made a city important? And we have these wonderful historic examples, Athens, Firenze, etc. Um, you all see uh, that certain elements, and we can go to the last one, are a certain uh, coexistence of important elements are, are to be found together. This is power, citizenry, economy or wealth, the worldview, which in our case I think should be a new worldview, uh, knowledge, knowledge creation, and arts. And if these elements are somehow together, of course in all, in, in each case in a kind of different configuration, then there is a chance for a city or a city assembly to become influential, important uh, <clears throat> part of, of um, the region where it exists. Um, now, so the proper lecture I would like to give to you is about intercultural heritage in an age of fluid identities. Um, I'm going to use two examples. One is the recent past, which we have a tendency to celebrate, um, the commemoration, as you heard yesterday, of um, the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, some people, many people in Hungary, are talking about the Paris Peace Treaties. For us, it's called Trianon, that was a little palace um, in Trianon, where the big powers decided about the fate of the losers. Uh, of the First World War, uh, <clears throat> and which had for Hungarians, from a strictly Hungarian point of view, some tragic consequences. But go back in the history then, Hungary was a um, second uh, player in a, a then world power, the Habsburg Empire, which became the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the monarchy, um, which had a wonderful age we call very often the Golden Age. Um, and it happened, but if you see at this, look at the map, it shows a huge amount of different ethnic <coughs> different cultures, and different languages. Um, and if you see um, this brownish in the middle, the brownish color, these are the Hungarians. But we have a lot of Germans. We have Romanians, 
Italians, Serbians, Croats, very, very colorful, very colorful um, cultural map. And that was the Habsburg Empire, which became, after the compromise in 1867, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, where Hungarians had a tendency to believe <coughs> that they are actually ruling together with the Austrians, ruling all the others. That was a very special mindset. And on the other hand, this empire had a huge amount of potential which we tend to forget, even up until the end of, of its existence. When this First World War broke out, it showed that there is very little hope to, to maintain the empire, but it had a fantastic potential of combining a national and aspirations of different ethnic groups to express their, um, their identities within the boundaries of the empire. So it's not uh, at all true that nationalisms in their milder forms are necessarily controversial or exclusive vis-a-vis -vis a larger unit, let's say an empire, or today <coughs> what we have, the European Union. Um, now, why do we call this age the Golden Age? Because somehow um, the Habsburgs had to change their attitude towards the world. They were beginning towards uh, Germany, the industrializing Germany, um, England, and other big powers. And the compromise came in 1867 after the countdown of the Hungarian um, Freedom Party in 1948, um, which gave space for a cultural um, explosion. First of all, and that, this is my first example, Budapest. Budapest did not exist in that form. There was a flat <coughs> place, small city called Pest, and there was another one, Buda, with a lot of, um, lot of cultural heritage from the, from the German um, population, German aristocracy, uh, German patricius population. Um, there, was, there was some kind of cooperation with these two, between these two cities, but they were two cities. This new situation, the compromise between the Hungarian uh, political class, the aristocracy and the Habsburgs, um, kind of uh, collided with the fact that Budapest became a city, Pest Budapest. It was united uh, in 1873 and it started to flourish. Now, that gave space for um, a fantastic um, explosion of creativity, arts, um, um, culture, poetry, later on music, cafes. So Budapest, in a couple of decades, became a global city. And my, my next point is it was possible because it became an amalgamation of different cultures, of different ways of thinking, an amalgamation of a new urban center, which had a global aspiration. Uh, it was felt that the Habsburg Empire needs a second center. So it was the second capital of a still strong but weakening empire. Without the political and military strengths of Vienna, um, it, it, was a very, it became a very important cultural um, and artistic and architectural center. So this was a miracle. Um, the city was built in a couple of decades, out of nothing. Now, how was it possible? So we had um, a strong tendency of the Hungarian nobility and aristocracy to become, if not completely independent, but semi-autonomous. And um, that was a big aspiration to be the rulers of this you know, you remember the first slide, uh, very various ethnic um, cultural space. The Hungarians had a strong tendency to believe that we are um, a kind of a dominating power. And the most important factor was is a, hu a, a huge migration flow of Jewish population. 
most of them coming from the east, some of them from the north, from Moravia. Um, and because the Hungarians knew, of course, that to compare to the others, Hungary, Hungarians were a minority. The Jewish population, um, the migrants at that time, were ready to Hungarianize themselves. So with this growing Jewish population, um, who, who became part of the Hungarian so-called nation, it was possible to reach um, more or less the majority <coughs> towards the others, the Serbians, the Romanians, the Slovaks, uh, and the others. Now, that was a fascinating time, uh, and we don't have time to go into details. Um, many of the great authors, poets, journalists, writers, <coughs> came from the countryside and out of the sudden they became um, Budapest authors. Most of them actually never left Budapest, basically. So it was, a, it was a kind of an explosion, a cultural explosion and a miracle, I would say, between 1870 and 1910. That was the third, three or four decades when Budapest was created, architecturally, mostly by the Jewish financial capital, culturally by this mixture of um, Hungarian artists and writers, Jewish journalists, and of course a lot of um, Germans still living in Buda and Pest. Um, and that kind of, of a cultural mixture became, I think, the largest, the most important activity of, of, of the city, which in a couple of years became a tourist destination. So you, it, it, before 1873, it didn't exist. There was no Budapest. Tourists didn't come to have fun. Yeah? There was the Buddha castle, the, you know, the power the center for a long time, dominated for 150 years by the Ottoman Empire, um, dominated by the Habsburgs for many, many decades. Uh, and there was Pesh, a small city um, of very little importance. And suddenly, it became um, a global city. Its growth, its development could be compared with Chicago and New York at that time. And, and maybe Berlin. In terms of knowledge creation, by the end of the century, um, Hungarians understood the importance of of higher education and research. Before that, most of the Hungarian, German, and Jewish young people went to Vienna and, and, and uh, Berlin to study. And in the moment when the universities were built in Budapest and Debrecen and other big cities, the situation completely changed. So it became strong culturally, it became strong uh, as a tourist destination, uh, <clears throat> touristically, and it became strong in, in terms of knowledge creation. Now, what people believed at that time, um, that is the future. It was a large space with a huge perspective. Yeah? And this is where I think um, space counts, size and space. To become a second capital of a still big world power meant a lot of things, even for those who did not like the Habsburgs, but, but still, Budapest after Vienna was, you know, the, the capital of, of, of the empire. And that gave perspectives for poets, for artists, for people who wanted to become politicians, for pedagogues, schools were mushrooming, as I said, universities, etc. And city development everywhere. That was the 40 years, not just Budapest developed, but somebody, hey, not finished. All these cities I call um, the, the important cities of Western Pannonia, were built in a similar way, with a similar speed between 1870, 1880, and uh, 1910. So this, what, this is a process what we call Ambour Chauvinsmont. A new middle class was born. And this development was very fast, but what it needed, and people understood it, um, who were running the city, a heritage, remembrance. So they started to invent um, a little bit the past. And they wanted to show the world, can we see this, um, um, how important <coughs> Hungarians were and how unique. And that is a, a 
that is an interesting point that, that the strong belief that um, we are unique thanks to our language, our history, our culture, being the last bastion of, of the West, defending the West is a very strong element of Hungarian identity. You can find it in textbooks, in history books everywhere. Even today, our politicians are referring to that point again. We are defending the best. And the interesting thing is in the discourse that although you can think it's ridiculous, and you can criticize it for good reasons, but there is a little element of truth. Because what happened in this time, that was again a time of free interpretation of the 19th century, the early 20th century, and a big, big uh, competition between all the new powers uh, for world domination. And the mission hmm, um, of the empire or the big nations was also questioned. So um, <clears throat> Western Europe believed, and we still have this, the Western part of Europe, that, that it is a kind of a civilizer of the outside world. Yeah. Napoleon um, invaded Egypt by telling uh, his soldiers that now, instead of that, we are going to kill these guys here, that we are going to civilize them. And still, I think one of the sicknesses of Europe is, is that we, we cannot forget about that the civilizing mission that we are telling the world how to think, what to think, what is democracy, what is political correctness, etc. Now, the Habsburg Empire was somewhat um, less developed, hmm? already losing a little bit the competition. Um, but they actually adopted this, this civilizing mission. So then they understood their limited um, impact to the western part of the world. The new idea was that this empire with its, uh, with its collective identity is going to civilize the eastern, Galicia, uh, <clears throat> and what they call the Balkans. That was a kind of internal colonization. And I have to say it, that Hungarians liked to be one of the, you know, the second dominating class in that kind of process. So we built uh, Budapest accordingly. Um, this is the hero square, but actually, <laughs> I live and we live and we are in Budapest very, very close, not because we are neighbors, but because this is so happened. And they, to, re to remember, to interpret Hungarians uh, at the millennium towards the end of the 19th century, um, 1896, started to um, create these fantastic monuments. Here in this round circle you see all the Hungarian kings, the great heroes. Um, uh, in the middle you see the seven tribes led by Arpad, our father Arpad, and the, 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 the tribal leaders. And then to the right, the picture that's not very sharp, they created the Kunsthalle, the first museum uh, which was supposed to show the world fantastic production of Hungarian artists, Hungarians, and a little bit others from the region. Now, I, we don't have time to go into details, but what I wanted to say with this, that certainly the appetite, um, the aspiration of that time was a little bigger one than to compare what we had in reality, de facto. The aspiration was that we now show the world that we are the second strong power in uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and we have a very, very important history which needs to be learned and showed to people. Um, and that one, one import, important and interesting moment is that instead of, and that's kind of good point, I think, to discuss for cultural heritage experts and interpreters, instead of just following the path of Vienna uh, art development, the Art Nouveau, the secession of uh, Gustav Klein. Hungarian artists, as well as architects, discovered very fast that, well, yeah, we want a secession a little bit, but we want to build our artistic style upon our special culture and history. So there was a, by, a, a, a diverse, or not controversial, but two-direction kind of development. Modernization, new technology, big buildings, etc., etc., great city, tourism, and on the other hand, 
and there was a tendency to go back to the East to discover Indian and Iranian um, motives. So the Hungarian secession was actually um, very much influenced by this tendency. Uh, Lechner, Erdön, Erdön Lechner, a German um, Hungarian architect, discovered um, these motifs and, and built fantastic, fantastic uh, buildings in Budapest, which was uh, again uh, uh, a target of debates and discussions. Um, the conservative political forces believe that it is too provocative, it's not really understandable, and some of them call it ugly. And then we are in a new time, we are at the beginning of the 20th century, <laughs> the head of the academy, uh, Count Vlasic, uh, called it because it was, he used the oriental motives. It's a kind of Jewish stuff. Modern antisemitism was born in the moment when the competition became too big in between a small culture, a small society, like the Hungarians, and although we welcomed the Jewish um, uh, migrants, as I said, uh, during the 19th century, the mid-19th century, because they helped to become Hungarians, the majority, uh, there, was a, uh, there was a growing envy and, and uh, competition and then exclusion, unfortunately, already at the beginning of the 20th century. So, um, Hungarian secession was different, and our the entire art um, development, uh, painting, <coughs> uh, writing, was also um, very um, Hungarian, it, in between, not completely Western. It's very different, very difficult to explain it to you in, in terms of writing poetry, because the language is so peculiar. It's more, uh, <coughs> more easy to show it in the architecture, and then I'm sure you are going to spend some time in Budapest, and you will find out what I'm, I'm, I'm speaking. Now, um, just go further, um, and um, I would like to give you two personal stories um, about um, attempts for intercultural dialogue or intercultural solution. This young man um, was a poet, a very talented young man, who was born in Shenya, a couple of kilometers from Somathei, and actually <coughs> went to school um, for several years in Kursai. Um, he was sent by his mother um, to England. He studied uh, and learned fantastically uh, good English, and went to Cambridge, where he became befriended with Virginia Woolf, John Maynard Keynes, one of the most influential um, economists of the 20th century, um, <clears throat> and many others. Um, he was a very talented poet, very young. But he saw that his mission is um, interpretation and cultural mediation. He, con he was convinced that because of our handicap, using a language nobody understands, he should translate the most important Hungarian poets into English, and he did so. And in this small circle of Virginia Woolf and, and Keynes, um, he was welcome. Um, he also translated Hungarian dramas from the 19th century, so he actually, against his young age, became a very effective, efficient cultural interpreter and mediator. Now, his story is very telling. He was, um, a pacifist. He hated war. He fell in love um, with the cousin of, of uh, Lawrence Olivier, um, uh, a young lady. It was a platonic love. Uh, his life was basically in English. He was a successful student there. Now the First World War breaks out. And he, because he was also a nobleman, he believed that as a good patriot, he has to participate in the war because it's about his, his homeland. And, and he didn't have money uh, to come back. Uh, he had to turn to Keynes, um, who had a very strong affection with a um, baker sheep. And against his will, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't stop him. He collected the money. Baker sheep came home the last day. The next day, there was a war declared against the Habsburg Empire. He wouldn't have traveled. 
and he was conscripted and uh, even though his voluntary went to war and he died the first day. He was just killed um, by Ukrainians um, the first day. Uh, but before that he wanted to meet with one of the biggest guys in Hungarian poetry, uh, Mihai Bovich, who actually knew about him. He knew that Bekashi was translating his poems and propagating his poetry in Cambridge. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, Bobic didn't show up. So Bekashi died before even having um, a congratulating handshake from then the biggest poet of Hungary. And, um, and um, Keynes managed to put his name in, in King's, College, King's College Chapel as um, uh, one of the heroes of the World, 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 First World War. Now, Bekashi was partly, in my interpretation, partly successful in his um, effort uh, about cultural um, mediation. That at least he had the sensitivity to understand the danger of isolation. That was um, uh, Kama Malek talking about. When a small group who is isolating itself by language or certain habits or the traditions and also politics is isolating it because politics is interested in creating conflicts and <coughs> sending people to wars. That's, that's a very dangerous uh, moment in history when it happens. Then it can create and unfortunately solidify identity, a very one, one dimension of identity. Maybe you remember yesterday I made a remark about the fluidity of identity. I do not believe that our identities are fluid, distinct. Um, uh, entities. I think they are like quantum type of entities. You might believe in a certain um, point in your life that you are only Hungarian. <coughs> Nothing but Hungarian. But when you dig down, and I'm coming to my second part of the presentation, you find out there is nothing like purely Hungarian in our history. We are all mixed up. And that is a huge work um, a huge challenge for cultural heritage interpreters, historians and, and, and uh, anthropologists and architects, etc., to find out what is our real intercultural heritage. Now, the second, I just uh, very, very shortly, and the audit was one of the biggest poets of that time. Um, at the very end of his life, before he died, he came to the conclusion in a short essay, a powerful essay, there is no other escape for Hungarians and also for Jews. Just do. And the only way to survive is to merge. He understood the dangers of anti-Semitism. Then he understood the dangers of the collapsing of the Austrian Empire. Hungary becoming a small, uh, isolated, uh, ethnically homogeneous state. And, um, well, what is said that we call ourselves Hungarians, do the love dance with hateful desire. Korobori is a love dance coming from Australia, Australian um, origins, um, where the women are playing the music and the men are dancing sometimes, uh, dancing themselves to death. And he's using this metaphor that the Jews play the music, the Hungarians dancing, it's a love, um, a love and hate affair, but we should come out of that and we should unite our forces because Jewish um, worldview, Jewish way of thinking, Jewish attitudes towards the world are helping Hungarians to come out from the little niche of self-insulating, uh, self-isolating culture. Um, uh, of course, it needless to say that it, it, it didn't, uh, how to say, become part of reality. Now, the second example, I'm sorry, I would need a little, a couple of more minutes we start a little later, so forgive me about um, <clears throat> that. Uh, it's about Kursak, a very small city <coughs> for city at the moment. Um, I said at the beginning that I believe that there is a renaissance of small cities, not only in Hungary, as, as well in Central Europe and maybe in Southern Europe. Um, and Kursak played a very important role um, during uh, the medieval ages and the, the renaissance. Um, it was a, it, probably the most important fortification before Vienna and the Ottoman invasions came. Um, 
And then it started to lose its significance when the Habsburg decided that they need a bigger place for transportation and logistics, and that was Somatne. And as a matter of fact, because of the secrets, like with the secrets of Kösen, it was always a very small place. Now it is 12,000 plus the neighborhood was 3,000. That time it was five or 7,000 people. It had a kind of creativity, and in my understanding, because of its cultural amalgamation of being German, Croatian, Croatian Hungarian, and then also Jewish, um, and, and of course, existing in the shade, in, in the ambiente of Vienna, Hmm? That kind of factors um, brought it together a constellation which made Kursak always creative. Now this creativity um, came out in the 17th, 18th century when Sobotha was um, flourishing in creation of schools. So it became a city of schools. I'm coming back to the siege a little later. Um, that means that um, while we were counting with the local archivists that at a certain moment, the same period I was talking about, the nine, end of 19th century, early 20th century, there were about nine, ten schools in these small cities. Catholic, um, Protestant schools, of course the Jews had their own um, <coughs> uh, uh, religious school, um, a school of women, uh, pedagogues and teachers, it was a military school, very famous, um, coming up in many of the, um, uh, of, the no of the novels and the literature. Most famously, uh, in Otley Giza, or Giza Otlix, school on the border. Um, that means that it has a, a double meaning. The school is left at the border, but it was a liminal situation after Trianon, after the First World War, when the Hungarians um, built uh, or continued his military education in Kursag. The school was called the Zögerei. Um, now, let's, let's go back a little bit to, um, to the medieval ages. Why Kursag uh, had so many secrets, it's hard to say. Um, in 1532, there was a siege um, a military campaign. Um, the Ottoman Empire was a military empire, and they had to <coughs> practice their military capacity. Interestingly, there was no real purpose <laughs> at that time. Of course, the general purpose was to conquer Vienna, one of the bastions of the Western world. But this, this year, um, Suleiman the Great was not so sure in, in this purpose. Nevertheless, the campaign started. About 200,000 people, um, including 90,000 Janissaries, arrived at Kursag in 1532. The castle was defended by a Croatian nobleman whose name is Nikola Jurišić, who didn't even speak Hungarian. He served the emperor in Vienna. And at a certain moment, um, he decided instead of joining the Christian army, which was very slowly gathering um, in front of Vienna, like a reluctant EU exercise, you know, they came, they didn't come, they didn't know. And Jurišić <laughs> had not, not 30, 38, 38 of German soldiers. Um, and um, between Kursak and Vienna, he sent a letter to, uh, to the emperor that, um, my, dear, my dear lord, I decided to change my mind. I go back to Kursak. Um, I see all these peasants running everywhere. I want to teach them how to shoot um, and how to fight. And we are trying to stop the Ottoman invasion that you have enough time to gather your military um, capacity to defend Vienna. Now, it sounds completely crazy, okay? And he gathered less than 1,000 people against 90,000 very well-trained Janissaries. Even if Ottoman Allah was not with, uh, with the Ottoman. It was raining for months. <coughs> they lost half of the ammunition. ammunition. The, the cannons were left in, 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 in Anatolia. They couldn't carry everything. But even so, the, the siege started and it took almost an entire month. You have this, um, this image. And, uh, you know, the, the Muslim visitors are trying to 
coming to the city, which was surrounded by walls and then the water. And of course, at the end of the month, basically everyone died, except a few Rishish and a few um, captives and women and children. And he went out to negotiate with the um, uh, Grand Vizier Ibrahim, who told him that, listen, you surrender, put the Turkish flags on the wall everywhere, hmm? and go to the Sultan who is watching this whole game, and kiss his hand. And Yurishi said, who was half dead already, no, I can't do that, I'm, I'm Christian, I can't kiss the hand of the Sultan, then they agreed that he's going to kiss the Kafkan. But if you do so, at that moment, I'm the Grand Vizier, I'm donating Kursak to you. That means I do not let Janissaries to come into the city. And it happens so. So these two guys, Yurishic and Ibrahim Pasha, they saved the city. That's one of the greatest secrets of the town. And only much later it turned out that they still need historical, um, historical research that they met in Istanbul years before. And, um, uh, and uh, Pasha Ibrahim was of Christian origin, he was a slave, um, a son of slave uh, Macedonian or Greek parents. So that, what does it mean? The, the city was defended by German soldiers, they were professionals of Serbian, yeah? um, some Croatian, Croatian nobleman was the captain, there were Hungarian peasants who didn't know how to fight, uh, so it's completely hopeless. But because these two people, in between them there was an intercultural um, dialogue, knew each other, they decided against the will of the Ottoman Empire to destroy a wonderful settlement like this. Now, there are other stories like this, and I only mentioned very quickly one because I have to finish about Philip Shea and the synagogue, because it has some, um, some consequences of um, our existence here. <coughs> Philip Shea was a, a son of a very poor Jewish family, who um, they were nobody in Kursak, but he was very talented and became a, a rich a merchant and we, he, he became um, uh, the first nobleman. He got his apartment from the Habsburgs, sometimes in the 60s, and lived in Vienna. But because he was born and he lived in Kursak, he came back and spent several weeks every year as the head of one of the banks and was actually distributing money and uh, built his level and, and also supported Catholic churches and kindergarten and many other things. Now, this um, story of the synagogue is really fascinating. We have um, now a project which is about restoring, reconstructing <coughs> 10 important buildings in Kursak. The synagogue is one of them. And we can go to the end, this will be the last um, pictures. Um, that these are all those built heritage sites which are under reconstruction. Um, can you show this in a moment? We have already Yes, um, this is how um, the Hungarian Nazis left it untouched and nobody actually did anything about it since um, 1944. And this, these are the new architecture plans. The building will be reconstructed next year and it's going to be um, a place of pilgrimage, a, 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 a space where um, people can contemplate about the past and about the future. We very much believe that it is going to be a space for intercultural dialogue and hopefully inviting not only rabbis and Catholic bishops but also imams to talk about the possible rapprochement between world religions and also the rabbi house, this small building, is going to serve <coughs> as a research space. We are going to give um, research grants for historians who want to uh, detect, to understand the importance of Jewish, the Jewish community within the region, which was much, much bigger than, than that number. In Kyrgyzstan, you only had 120 Jews to show the 
this picture when they were collected and and yes and um, yes that was the moment in 44 you see the gendarmerie at the at the beginning um, uh, at the at the you know the leaving the, the group they were taken uh, to the railway station and to Auschwitz there were only 120 um, but what is interesting there's a black hole in cultural heritage remembrance and, and dialogue. Um, there were some attempts to understand how people react and there were some dramatic uh, moments. There was a young person who was 50 years old when um, the Hungarian Nazis came from Budapest and forced them um, to create a small camp for Jewish population and he was given a, a, a rifle, a submachine gun, um, and then when the Soviet troops were coming, they were moving towards the west. And there was an emigration camp not far from here, around the Rechnitz, and the rest were forced to go towards Germany. And he remembered that there was a wonderful, a beautiful, a young Jewish lady, and they were, everyone was sick and tired, and they were walking, you know, crossing the border, and this Jewish lady made, made him understood that he would be very thankful to him if he could save um, her life. And he, this old man, a couple of years ago, told us in tears, in these rooms, that he was afraid that he is going to be killed by the Nazis. So he did not save the life of this wonderful and beautiful Jewish lady. Now these stories are mostly untold. And these stories, and there are many, I might, about also the communist times, of course, this is the Iron Curtain, <coughs> that I think this is our job, historians and, and social scientists and interpreters, to uh, reinterpret, to rethink these traumatic episodes and also the, um, the rich and powerful and successful episodes of our recent past. And so this is why, I'm sorry I couldn't, give you all these slides, the time was not enough, and the stories are tremendously interesting and long. Um, but there is a certain interesting interplay between continuity and discontinuity. The stories I didn't tell you, couldn't tell you because of lack of time, are about all this, that if you have an intense cultural place like this, the size and scope doesn't count, it doesn't matter how many people the roots, the intertwined roots of different cultures are so strong that you cannot eradicate just by force, just by killing the Jews, taking them to Auschwitz, but just by sealing the borders and going with an iron curtain and not letting anyone to come to Persia. They, they, the communists took away this, they, all the schools and closed them down, run by, by nuns, etc. When the time comes, and it came in 1990, all these things are the strong cultural roots are coming up and, and erecting flowers and bringing fruits again. We have again a strong re, a renewed identity of the city, uh, of being a city of schools. Um, and we have also a Kursak identity about a city where, um, I wouldn't say you can celebrate um, Islam, but we do have a Cafe Ibrahim the food is very good. I suggest you to the tribe. And it just celebrated its 30th anniversary a couple of days ago. But people remember that there was a Pasha Ibrahim, the strongest man of the, the superpower of that time, who decided not to destroy the city. So there is always a chance, and that chance is given by culture and the reinterpretation of cultural heritage to opt for the better. And our, our times are, as Malek uh, said yesterday and myself, are very dangerous times. And we have to think about this possibility. I wish you a very successful conference. Thank you very much.